Okay, so the point of this video is we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at why different molecules have different shapes. How do you explain that in a leaving cert question? And the other thing that we're going to look at is then um, why do different substances have different boiling points? So they kind of knowing one helps the other. So the first thing that we're going to do is to you have to know for any molecule they give you, you have to be able to draw its shape what its dot and cross looks like. So I'm going to start firstly with um, beryllium chloride, like so. And we just need to talk a little bit about, so this is this chlorine. It has seven electrons in its outer shell. This is this chlorine. It also has seven electrons in its outer shell. Um, even though beryllium is a metal and chlorine is a non-metal, this covalently bonds so these are the two electrons that bromine has or beryllium has in its outer shell and remember now that usually when things were drawing our dot and cross if you're hydrogen you need one electron for a full outer shell but if you are any other thing in our periodic table for which we draw dot and cross we need eight electrons in our outer shell beryllium and boron in our next diagram are the exceptions so this has four electrons in its outer shell and this is smiley face happy Okay, so if we were to explain why this molecule has this shape, so what is the shape? So for starters, the shape is linear. You get a bond angle of 180 degrees. Why is it linear? So this is the answer to your question. Uh, this particular line linear molecule has two bonding pairs. So that's the first thing your examiner is going to be looking for. The next thing that you can say is, what do we know? Well, bonding pairs are going to want to repel each other as much as they possibly can. So in this instance, that this, re this repelling will put them 180 degrees apart. Okay. So as I say, this they're never gonna ask you linear, unlucky, but if you were to do it, it's two bonding pairs, and in this instance, their bonding pairs repel as much as they possibly can. So in our next one, we're going to go with boron um, trifluoride, like so. Again, we just look at for your dot and cross, dot, 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 dot. So fluorine will have seven electrons in its outer shell, like so. Um, this is a covalent compound. Boron is just on the, the cusp of metals, non-metals, but again, so we're gonna make these guys in red down here. These are its seven electrons. Boron is element number five. It has two electrons in its inner shell and it has three on its outside. We usually would say that it's three electrons. It wants to get to this um, full outer shell of eight, but boron as well as beryllium is our exception because if you count here, this has only six electrons in its outer shell, but again, boron now is smiley face happy. So, what is, what is the shape for this particular molecule? This is a trigonal planar molecule and the bond angle here is 120 degrees between each thing. Okay, so that is 120 degree angle here. So what would be the explanation? Why does this have a trigonal planar shape? You have to tell your examiner what it has. It has three bonding pairs. And just as before with the linear molecule, the bond, these bonding pairs repel each other as far as they possibly can. And the furthest that they can get away from each other is 120 degrees. So it's only bonding pairs in these first two that are influencing their shape. Okay, so I've told my examiner what's present and I've said The, the reason why. So it's these bonding pairs repelling as much as they possibly can. Okay, our next one type of molecule is going to be methane. So this is for my sixth years and they have already gone through their organic. So they understand the structure. So hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell and carbon is uh, atomic number of six, it has six electrons in its outer shell, or sorry, six electrons in total, so that's arranged as a two and a four. So these are my electrons from 
carbon. The octet rule now holds in that there is eight electrons around the carbon and that makes it happy, smiley face. So you need to recognize for the molecule CH4, this is now tetrahedral in shape and it has a bond angle of 109.5. So again, if you're explaining why something is tetrahedral, you're telling your examiner what is present. There are four bonding pairs. And again, we have this down here, the idea that the bonding pairs are repelling as much as they possibly can. Um, and in this instance, we end up with a bond angle of 109.5. Okay. So they usually will give you a tetrahedrally bonded molecule more than likely okay so in th these three examples linear tetrahedral or trigonal planar it is an, a difference in the bonding pairs how many bonding pairs they have and also it is what those bonding pairs do so bonding pairs will repel each other so as you said this gives us 109.5 degrees now we get to something like ammonia okay and ammonia, it could be anything that is in group 5. So it could be NH3, PH3, ASH3. They're all going to have the same shape because they're in group 5. So they all have the same number of outer shell electrons. And they will all um, behave in the same way with hydrogen. So what do we know? Again, as earlier, we know hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell. We know... Um, ammonia or nitrogen has an atomic number of seven it means there's seven electrons in total two in our first shell and we will have to have five in our outer shell so these are three of my five and we have now this new thing so this up here we call it a lone pair it is an electron pair that is not involved in bonding okay not and we're only interested in central molecules that have electron pairs because you could say up here if i just scroll up here you could say that technically these guys up here are lone pairs because they are not involved in bonding but when we have our setup like this we have a very particular shape so we call this um pyramidal you can call it trigonal pyramidal if you so wish and the bond angle here is now down to 107 degrees between, make this one, between your bonding pairs. So if we had a comparison between our tetrahedral and between our pyramidal shapes, again, we describe what our tetrahedral has. It has four bonding pairs and those bonding pairs are repelling as much as they can. If we are answering for this particular um, molecule, shape we are saying that this pyramidal has three bonding pairs and one lone pair so that's going to get you a tick that is uh, the first marking point and now why is tetrahedral 109.5 and pyramidal is um 107 and the reason is the presence of a lone pair pushes your bonding pairs even closer together. Pushes your bonding pairs closer together and this reduces your bond angle. Okay, so if we had to do a comparison between tetrahedral and trigonal planar, your marking points are coming for four bond pairs in your tetrahedral. Your second marking point is going to come from your three bond pairs and one lone pair. Okay, I'm allowed to write these and not full words. You are not. And your third marking point is coming from what it is that your lone pairs do. So they push your bonding pairs even closer together you want to put that in and that's why we get the smaller bond angle of 107 versus 109.5 okay the last possible molecule and shape is going to be something like h2o and again anything that is in group six 
It could be H2S. It could be H2SE. These will all have the same shape because they're in group six and they will interact with oxygen in the same way. So this is how we do our dot and cross for oxygen. Again, each hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell. And we now put in our X's. So hydrogen, or sorry, oxygen is atomic number of eight. It means it has eight electrons. Their distribution is a two and a six. So we're only looking at outer shell electrons. Excuse me here. So apologies. So the difference here now is we have two lone pairs in our dot and cross for water. So what things do we know? We know that this is bent or V-shaped, and I've always asked you to write down both. So we can't, doesn't matter what they do with their mark scheme. And our bond angle here now is 104.5 degrees. So if we were doing a comparison between our triangle, our pyramidal and our bent or V-shaped, our we have to describe what's going on in our bent. Why is it bent and V-shaped? And it is bent and V-shaped because there are two bonding pairs and there are two lone pairs. We then also have to say the two lone pairs, they are now going to repel the bonding pairs even more than we saw in ammonia. Repel bonding pairs to a, a, a much greater extent. And this is reducing our bond angle to, to 104.5. Okay, so if we were comparing, we shall we say tetrahedral to bent, you would tell your examiner that we have four bonding pairs in our tetrahedral. You would tell your examiner we now have two BP and two LP for our V-shaped and our bent. And then we were putting this blurb in here that the two lone pairs repel the bonding pairs to a much greater extent. And that's why we're getting this reduction in bond angle from 109.5 all the way to 104.5. Okay, so... We have now described why molecules are the shape they are and what's the detail that you need to have in your exam. Just to say, every time you put on a lone pair, your bond angle decreases by 2.5 degrees. So, linear, easy. Planar, easy, because 3 into 360 is 120. Tetrahedral, you need to remember the number. And then once you have this number, you're subtracting 2.5 to get our 107. And you're subtracting 2.5 to get our 104.5. Okay, I hope this was helpful. We're going to now go up and we're going to go across and we're now going to talk why different substances have different boiling points. So you do have to recognize their shape. Um, before we get into um, specific molecules, we are just going to talk about our intermolecular forces. Okay, so we, there's three intermolecular forces that exist. You have to, to know what they are, and you have to recognize from your molecule structure what it is um, they do. So we are always putting the adjective in front of their degree of strength. So the first thing that everything has is weaker van der Waals forces. Okay, you will see on mark schemes that these can be called um, temporary dipoles because that's what they are for a split fractions of seconds. There's an over um, abundance of electrons in one particular portion of your nucleus and that influences uh, a nucleus next to it um, and in that way that nucleus would become ever so slightly positive but then the electrons move in their orbits and we get um, a different um, dipole forming they can also be called what are called london dispersion dispersion forces i use weaker van der waals because i like saying the dutch name okay now 
everything has van der Waals. That is the, the key point of van der Waals. Every molecule has van der Waals. And in a mark scheme, what our explanation of this is, the more electrons you have, the bigger, the more mass you have, and the more van der Waals you have. Okay, so you just need to bear in mind sometimes they might put in a question, if you have molecules that are the same size, why does this one have a higher boiling point? So everything has van der Waals, that becomes easy. You tick a box. Then you have to decide when you look at, um, at a particular molecule, is these the last two IMFs an option? So we'll start with the the, the strongest intermolecular force, and we call it strongest hydrogen bonding. So what are you looking for when you are trying to identify strongest hydrogen bonding? So we have NOF is what we use in lesson, and what we are looking for, what that means is there's an N with a H, there's an O with a H, or there's an F with a H present in our molecule. And if that is the case, then we get a permanent dipole. So I'm just going to go HF as a, as a molecule. If you were to, that is a permanent dipole. So when we see that in a diagram, we will have a little negative here and a little positive here. And if we could see the electrons in the shared pair, this is what they would look like. Okay, and how do we get work that out? We look at our electronegativity values and you will see that this one is about four in the electronegativity value. I don't have my tables in front of me. I'm gonna go, this one is about 2.1. We take away four, 2.1. When we do that, we get, I can do this in my head, 1.7. And we have said for, to put in dipoles, we need to be um, 0.4 to 1.7, greater than 0.4 to 1.7. We get to put our little dipoles in. And all that's telling us is, in this molecule, the electrons are nearly all the way over to the fluorine, not with the hydrogen. Okay, so strongest hydrogen bonding, we're looking for an NH, an OH, or an FH in our molecule. Essentially, in a different type of words, we are looking for hydrogen bonded to a small, highly, highly electronegative um, electronegative atom is the other way that you can say it okay it's not enough to say enough you have to you can say nitrogen or hydrogen bonded with nitrogen oxygen or fluorine or you can say it like so okay so they're the extremes does something of hydrogen bonding it should be easy to recognize it because as i say you're looking for nh oh or fh in your molecule so the last one the last one is going to be um strongest stronger dipole dipole interactions and forgive me because i need to find chemistry tables just to show you this so how do i figure this one out strongest dipole dipole interactions so this is where we are looking at a certain part of our molecule and we are looking for uh, electronegativity values so something as simple as HCl. When we look at this, we are looking for the electronegativity values. Let's see. Nope, it's not showing me now. I'm trying to find electronegativity tables and I can't do it. Chemistry. No, nope, it's not going to be my day on this front. No, nope, it is not going to be my day. So apologies for this. I will find it. Here we go. Ionization. Electronegativity values. So I am looking at my electronegativity values. When I go look at chlorine, it says 3.16. When I go look at hydrogen, it says 2.2, so I was a little bit off earlier. We take one from the other, and in this instance, we get the 
difference is going to be 1.04. I'm doing it in my head, so apologies if I'm wrong. And again, the 1.04 falls between the greater than 0.4 to the 1.7. So this tells me that that particular molecule has a stronger, the stronger dipole-dipole interactions. That allows me again to draw my delta values here. So the bigger your number, that's the one that's more negative. And if we could see the shared pair electrons, they're all the way over to the chlorine. Okay. So a little hint for your stronger dipole dipole is if there is um, no OH, FH, NH, but if you have an oxygen present or if you have a halogen present, then there is a good chance that you will have um, stronger dipole dipole interactions. Okay, so we're going to look at some molecules and how do you recognize your dipole-dipole interaction from a structure. So we have our ethane, our ethene from our organic chemistry. We are going to draw this particular molecule, which we may have not done yet with my chemists. So this is ethene because it has the double bond as part of the alkenes. This particular one has two carbons. So you should know that two carbons is going to be an eth um, in the beginning of our name. And this functional group over here is what's called an aldehyde functional group. So we end these in an al. And the last one we're going to look at without going into carboxylic acids, um, but we're going to look is at an alcohol. So. So again, two carbons, this makes this particular molecule an eth again, and because it's an alcohol, we call it ethanol. So we have these three. First thing I need to figure out is what's going on between my C's and my H's. So in the maths tables, electronegativity values, C is going to be 2.55 and my H is 2.20. When I do my maths for this, I get 0.35, and our rule is 0 0.4 to less than 0.4. We say that this is a nonpolar covalent bond. So these guys doesn't get any deltas. So there's definitely no NOF in this. From my electronegativity, tables there's no dipole dipole in here and we've said everything has van der Waals the weakest van der Waals so that gets a tick so this guy has only weaker van der Waals present because it only has weaker van der Waals well we'll come back to it so again we look here at our ethanol the c's and the h's we now know they don't have any um impact they're all going to just be nonpolar, so there's only going to be van der Waals. So now we look at the C and the, the double bond O. So from my maths tables here, the O is going to be 3.44. My C is going to be 2.55. We do the maths. So you're going to get me talking to myself now. It's 9, carry the 1, 6 from 4 is 8 carry the 1 so when we take our differences here we now get 0.89 and again this is falls in from greater than 0.4 to 1.7 so th this suggests it can be a dipole when I look at this molecule there is no NOF so that gets an X there's no OH NH or FH there because I am in this range now this particular molecule will have stronger dipole-dipole, so that's going to get a tick. And I can draw in, if I wish, my little delta negative and my delta positive here. As we said, there's no NOF, and we've also said everything has um, van der Waals, so that also gets a tick. Okay, apologies for the squashiness. Okay, so we have one molecule, ethene, that only has van der Waals. We have ethanol which had an electronegativity difference between my C and my O, between my 0.4, greater than 0.4 and 1.7. 
because of that, that now it has strongest dipole dipole. And then the last one that we're looking at here is straight away this portion of my molecule, apologies, straight away this portion of my molecule satisfies the NOF criteria. There's an OH bond there, so this must have um, strongest hydrogen bonding. It can't have dipole dipole and hydrogen and hydrogen bonding, so this one gets an X, and we have said everything gets van der Waals. Now, very, very quickly, C2H4, CH3, CHO in terms of our formulas, and C2H5, OH. So we're just going to have a quick look at their molecular masses. So that is going to be 12 plus 12 is 24, plus 4 is 28. So this has a molar mass of 28. Here we have 12 and 12 is 24, plus 4 hydrogens is 28, plus 16, 28, 38, 44. And our last one down here is um, our ethanol. And that is, again, 12 and 12, 24, plus 6 is 30, plus OH is 46. So technically, if we were just looking at van der Waals, as, we get, as these get bigger, the boiling point would get higher because they have more electrons, more mass, and so on. But now we have the added. Our boiling point does decrease as you go from ethene, something that just has van der Waals, to ethanol, which has van der Waals and dipole-dipole, to ethanol, which has van der Waals and hydrogen bonding. But the fact that it's not going to be a, a lovely linear increase, the fact now that this um, molecule here has dipole dipole will make this have a higher boiling point compared to our van der Waals only molecule here okay so they'll both contribute to it okay but the ethanol down here will be even bigger again because it has the weaker van der Waals and because it has hydrogen bonding in here so you can get it by looking at its structure and then by looking at its electronegativities. We haven't talked about polar bonds in nonpolar molecules. Usually for your type of questions, they will make it um, exceptionally obvious as to what your differences are. But that would be how you would approach a question like this that's asking you to why different substances have different boiling points. So you look at the intermolecular forces, you do have to use your electronegativity values just to work out where am I. So nonpolar covalent only will ever have van der Waals. Does something have dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen bonding, as we said, is easier to see because of NOF. Um, the dipole-dipole is, is possibly the tougher one, but as we've said, if you have something that has oxygen or if you have a halogen attached then usually that will have stronger dipole-dipole as well as van der Waals. Now, did a lot of talking. I hope this makes sense to you. Come back to me if it doesn't.